Hey everyone, this week we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of cases of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife what is due her and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by agreement for a set time to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So here's where we see that the Corinthians actually wrote a letter to Paul and he's finally now responding to it. It's taken him this long, six chapters, because he wanted to set this foundation of the cross and the resurrection or return of Christ. And the problem that seems to be going on here is that there are married people who are refusing to sleep with their spouses. Uh, and that's what it means when it says to touch a woman, right? That's that's a euphemism. Um, and the best guess as to why they would be doing this is because they believe that sex is inherently bad, that somehow it's, it's too bodily, too material. It, it makes your soul unclean. And so spiritual people should avoid it. Uh, it's actually the kind of the opposite problem that we saw in chapter 6, where some uh, church members are, are sleeping with sex workers. But it's actually the same root behind them, that they're both devaluing the body, you know, splitting between the body and the spirit. One side is saying, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. The other side says, it does, and you can't do anything like that. And so Paul, throughout this chapter, has a nuanced or kind of complicated view of marriage and celibacy and sex. He doesn't completely reject what they say, but he tries to dig a little bit deeper. Now, pastorally, he just has to point out and acknowledge, hey, what you're trying to do isn't actually working. Um, it's probably not a coincidence that you have some people in this church, some partners who want to give up sex, and other partners who are wanting to look for it elsewhere. Uh, those may be the same, uh, the two sides of the same marriages. And so he recognizes that this is, this is a need, this is a desire, there's going to be a temptation. And so you, he's encouraging these couples to meet one another's needs in that area. Paul does not consider sex or the body inherently bad. As we've talked about before, that idea comes from Greek philosophy, not uh, from the Judeo-Christian view. Unfortunately, those views have often worked their way into Christian theology, and that's why we have some messed up views on that. But again, resurrection is one of, one of those foundational uh, beliefs, and that shows that the body is not evil. Uh, and that, I think, includes even the sexual aspects of the body, as long as there is respect and mutuality. Because that's actually what he's encouraging here. He talks about mutual submission, that you both belong to one another. Now, the Romans will obviously assume that, well, yeah, a man has authority over the woman, but they would probably be shocked, and this was pretty controversial in, in their time, to say that the woman has authority over the man's body. And so that's working both against patriarchy and the sense that even in marriage, we are absolutely independent of one another. Now, this is still misused. You can find plenty of Christian marriage books that use this verse to force women to have sex against their consent. But the point is that, that marriage, love, relationships, it's meant to be mutual. There's a need for self-control, but also we need to celebrate the gifts that are given in committed relationships.